What we're talking about today is the power and the importance of singing together or corporate worship, according to Paul. He thinks as he starts to paint a picture of what the church should look like, he believes some of the richness, some of the goodness, some of the beauty that Jesus had in mind when he created the church comes when the church sings together. That when we sing, we preach. I wanna challenge you as a leader that um, part of your worship team is the congregation. And if you're not helping teach and cultivate a worship culture that permeates past this platform and into the congregation, then you're missing out on a huge percentage of what God had in mind when his church sings together. All right, how are we doing? You guys hanging in there? Getting hungry? I probably shouldn't have called that out. Now you're just gonna think about that the whole time. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, my name is Aaron Bjorklund. I, uh, a couple things about me just to get things kicked off. Uh, this was last week, this is my family. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Allison, for 18 years. I have a 15-year-old daughter, an 11-year-old daughter, and then the one-year-old there in the stroller. And um, yeah, good times, good times. <laughs> Uh, they, I was outnumbered when I got married, and then I just kept having girls, you know, just like, so it's awesome. Um, yeah, I have been the worship pastor here for, for 13 years, and with that, it's been a tremendous joy. Uh, there's been seasons of highs and seasons of lows, leadership challenges, all those sorts of things. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I've faced throughout the course of my ministry here is actually an internal challenge. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but there's been seasons where I've doubted everything about what I do. Is this even okay? Is it even okay to stand on a stage under lights and to be amplified and supported by all this music? And like, I, I noticed this ability in myself where I can... I can actually move a room emotionally based upon all of these resources and tools and bells and whistles and my charisma and my stage and personality. Is that even okay? This is one of the challenges that I've faced. I remember um, a while back, I took a sabbatical and I told Jake this actually before the sabbatical. I said, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is whether I can even keep on doing this because I, I had doubts about the whole system. Have I been swept up just in the culture of a worship culture? Have I, have I just, is, is this still a valid form of ministry? I mean, after all, I don't even see it in scripture, at least not expressed in the way that we do it nowadays, uh, which makes sense. Uh, they didn't have the same technology and all those sorts of things, but I just was wrestling. Uh, some of what I want to talk to you about today is uh, some answers to some of those wrestlings that I've come across over the years? <laughs> this is the question. Is it even healthy? Or what role do, does or can modern worship play in God's kingdom? Um, this has messed with my head almost more than any other thing. And there's been plenty of leadership challenges and team challenges and all those sorts of things. But it's actually just saying, Jesus, I really love your kingdom. I really want your way, your kingdom to advance around this world. And I'm always a little bit skeptical about the way that I do that here on this particular platform with this particular pedal board and these lights and these, this equipment and all of that. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, is it just me? Anyone else ever had these kinds of doubts? All right. <laughs> uh, if not, then maybe if you make it to the 13-year mark, you'll start to creep in, and this will be helpful preemptively for you um, in the future. So uh, we're going to actually look at a passage in Colossians to just give us some insight. I think Paul gives us some insight into the role that modern worship or more, more precisely in, in this text, it'd be the role that music plays in God's kingdom. 
So we're going to look at the church in Colossae. But before we do that, I just want to pray. Father, I thank you so much for each person that's come into this room, for the ways that they uh, have set aside time to grow, to invest in their leadership. Um, and Lord, I, I pray that as we, as we look at your word today, that you would enable us to hear your voice, you would enable us to settle in our hearts why it is that we're doing the things that we're doing. Give us wisdom, give us insight into your heart for this thing that we call worship in the modern church. And Lord, I pray that you would empower people as a result of this gathering, of this conference, and that they would go out and they would leverage uh, their giftings and their callings to advance your kingdom in the world. Because Lord, let your will be done and your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. That's our desire. And if that's, uh, that, that's the only thing that happens, Lord, it is a huge win. <laughs> so we, we ask that you would. Amen and amen. So the church, uh, in Col the, the book of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, he writes to this little sort of obscure church in um, Colossae. It's a, it's a very diverse church. He's writing because it's a church full of uh, Gentiles, it's a church full of Jews, and both of them are sort of like mixing in a little bit of their cultures into the church. Uh, a lot of scholars believe that um, maybe some of the things that, G that Paul's trying to correct in this church is that the, the Gentiles are sort of adding sort of syncretism into uh, their worship of Jesus, like I'll include my gods and worship of my gods or some of my traditions uh, into the church. And then the Jews also were doing the same thing. They're going to say, I'm going to still follow some of the laws. And there's some tensions. And so all throughout the book, he's correcting this sort of thing. But then in chapter three, which is where we're going to spend most of our time this, uh, this morning, I guess it's still morning. I can still call it this morning, um, is uh, he pivots in chapter three because he's, he's corrected some of these things. And again, one of the things I've been wrestling, what I've wrestled with over the years as I've done this ministry is, have I let the world creep in to the way I do ministry? Are the stages of the world too similar to the stages of my church family? And this is some of the tension. And so Paul's correcting this, but then in chapter three, he pivots and he starts to say, you know what? No, no, I've corrected these things. I've given you some instruction, but now... What I really want to do is I want to paint a picture of what it looks like to be a new kind of community. I want, to, I, want, I want to help you to imagine what it looks like for you to be a new kind of community in this world. And that's what he's doing here. And we'll pick up in uh, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. It says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Again, he's painting pictures for them, helping them understand what this new uh, community looks like. Clothing yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together with perfect unity. I mean, that sounds incredible, right? Like, look at some of these things. Binding them together with perfect unity. Forgiving each other. Like, this is the Jesus way. This is the kind of community that the church has been called to. The question is, it sounds good, but how? How? How do we get to that destination? It's a beautiful picture, but sometimes it seems unattainable. Well, fortunately for us, he goes on to, to give us some reasons or some how behind that picture. He, he says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since you, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ and get this, get this, get this. The meshes of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, through hymns, and through songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, 
whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So he does this very strange thing. I think it's maybe something I didn't expect to see in the scriptures because I had this assumption for much of my life that uh, worship as I experience it doesn't show up in the Bible. But he has this belief that there's this richness that can come and that richness is associated with the corporate singing of psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Let the message of Christ dwell in, among you richly as you teach and admonish. And there's this connection there in the Greek, both to the richness that he's talking about, to the teaching and to the music or the psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God. So what we're talking about today is the power and the importance of singing together or corporate worship, according to Paul. He thinks, as he starts to paint a picture of what the church should look like, he believes some of the richness, some of the goodness, some of the beauty that Jesus had in mind when he created the church comes when the church sings together. There's a way of singing that is transformative for a community. So that's what we want to access (laughs) If all the lights and the sound and all of this disappears, um, Paul still believes that there is a way a community can sing together that transforms and enriches the life of the body of Christ. This is what's going on. Again, he he says you're going to teach and you're going to admonish with psalms. So when we... When we're up here leading, or when you're participating in the sound booth, and you're projecting lyrics, and you're mixing sound, or whatever, you're participating in a sermon. Remember, this is a teaching activity. This is a different kind of sermon than the sermon that usually comes after the singing portion. So one thing we can do is we can remember that when we sing, we preach. This morning, when you worshiped together, even though this isn't uh, one body one, or one church family here, uh, we are members of the body of Christ. When we sang together, we preached to one another. And not just the person on the platform. When you mix sound and you amplify and you create an environment where people can sing corporately to the living God, we preach. This is the value. But... And this is what sort of helped me start to understand the significance and the power and the beauty of this particular medium. It's a different kind of sermon. Most sermons are very left brain activities. Uh, when, what I'm doing now, I'm using words, I'm making arguments, I'm laying out uh, logical flows of thought. This is a very left brain activity. But the corporate singing of God's church is a very right brain activity. You know, obviously, we, we, uh, we are still using words when we're singing, poetry and melodies, but music has this ability to capture and, in, and fire the neural pathways in the right-hand side of your brain. And so when we sing together, we actually get the truths of the message of the gospel into a larger portion of our very physiology. Don't miss this part of the sermon. It's, it has access to a part of the self, part of the human body and mind that the rest of the sermon may not always have access to. This is a significant thing that we do. And I think that's why Paul brings it up over and over again. N.T. Wright said it this way, to use the human body as a musical instrument, he's speaking about singing, is physically, emotionally, and mentally transformative in a way that nothing else quite is. That's quite the statement from a New New Testament scholar who specializes in Pauline literature. Just soak that in for a minute. What we're doing when we lead the, the body of Christ in singing is significant in this way. 
The way an individual sings will either amplify or weaken the praises of the community. Um, so I, I first gave this message to our church family because I was trying to help our church body grow in our corporate worship. And uh, as I've shifted this message to try and adapt it for you, I realize I, for, for my church family, I might be trying to convince them the importance of them leaning in and singing and engaging in body, uh, you know, in, in, with their body in the corporate singing. But for you, I want to challenge you as a leader that um, part of your worship team is the congregation. And if you're not helping teach and cultivate a worship culture that permeates past this platform and into the congregation, then you're missing out on a huge percentage of what God had in mind when his church sings together. So the way an individual sings will either amplify or it will weaken the praises of the community. And so as a leader who's been called to lead or to facilitate or to amplify corporate worship, this is some of the things you need to be thinking about. Almost every song, every light, every amplified instrument should serve the corporate singing of God's church. This is the target. The target is not to keep up with the, the next big church and the next big tech piece. That, that's not the target. Those are all servants to the corporate singing of God's people because that is what Paul has in mind. That's what Jesus has in mind is when his people gather together, they sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The congregation is one of the most important members of your worship team. And treat them that way. That might be categorically different than anything you've ever thought of before. And I would challenge you, what are the implications? If this is true, how do you as a leader lead them as they lead each other? <laughs> do you need to do a seminar? Do you need to do some teaching? Do you need to challenge your lead pastor to teach on corporate worship? Do you need to teach on corporate worship? What do you need to do to access and train your congregation to lead each other in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs? Um, some of the things that I've, I've learned and some of the things that I've been trying to teach my congregation over the years is the significance of the, of the body in worship. I learned this about myself a um, uh, number of years ago. I was struggling because I could never worship unless I was on stage leading worship. And I was thinking, how arrogant is that? And I was wrestling, and I remember I was attending another church at the time, and I wasn't on stage very often. I was just struggling to worship, and I realized, okay, um, what's going on? I was wrestling with God. Am I arrogant? Am I prideful? Whatever. One particular Sunday, the, the volume was turned up a little bit louder, and I, I, I started to sing from the depths of my being I, for the first time in a long time and raise my voice, because uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I have a pretty loud voice. <laughs> um, and I never wanted to be that guy in the congregation. So when I was in the congregation, I would always sing pretty softly because I didn't want to be that guy who was like three rows back and was just like shouting in your ear. And, and so I would always sing quietly. This particular Sunday, the volume was loud enough that I started to sing really, really loud. And it was like the physical feeling of my vocal cords raising up to hit that note, to declare the goodness and the beauty of God. It was suddenly that feeling of the muscles in my chest and in my throat suddenly connected the dots between the ideas that I was saying about God and my affections for God. And I learned that in order for me to worship, I have to sing and I have to sing hard. My body was the conduit through which I was able to engage in worship. And a lot of churches, um, not all churches, some churches do a really good job. Congregations who are very expressive physically in their worship. Other churches are very, very stoic. And so I've been trying to help our church realize that their bodies are a significant part of the connection between worship and, um, and their affections and their emotions for God. A couple other things that are of interest. Uh, there's this journal for humanities and social science, a group, uh, here's the title of the study, <laughs> Group Singing as a Resource for the Development of Healthy Public, a Study of Adult Group Singing. 
Fascinating study. They did this study and they actually learned that corporate singing, and this is a secular study, so they studied a few religious groups, but they also studied concerts, all these sorts of things. They're, even at a secular concert, there's like this transcendent thing that takes place. When everyone's singing all together, this is one of the things they're studying. And they started to realize that uh, some of the neurons that fire in your brain actually bond you in unity to the crowd around you as you sing. You're actually changing the, the neural structures of the church as you sing together. There's almost nothing like corporate singing to do this. It creates unity. This is why if you've ever sung in a choir, um, there's like something about singing in a choir and working hard together and singing together. Uh, some of the things that, that are taking place here. And I think Paul knows this when he teaches in Col- uh, to this church in Colossians. Remember, you have Jews and you have Gentiles. This group's saying we need to do these things. This group's saying these things. And, and Paul's like, you know what? Some of the solution to this disunity that I'm seeing in this church is I want you to do some more singing together. And he said to him, um, this is another text uh, that I think is fascinating to me. Uh, this is Jesus speaking uh, when he's asked, what's the most important commandment? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think that if uh, you look at this text, one of the ways that we can corporately obey all of this text uh, all at once is when we sing together. Think about it. We're using our heart, our soul, and our mind. It's one of the only environments I can think of where this entire obedience to the greatest command that Jesus gives here can all be done as a church family simultaneously. It's a beautiful thing. So remember that when you lead in singing, we preach to a part of the church that the sermon might not touch. So we're actually creating unity when we sing together. We're actually bonding the congregation together. Some of the tensions that we've had coming out of COVID and people not wanting to come back to church or finding disunity in the church post-COVID, all these sorts of things, maybe some of the things you could do is challenge your church to grow in their willingness and their ability to sing together. It could heal them. So a couple of tips real quick um, on how to lead in this way. Spend some energy teaching your church. Model full body worship for them. Do this yourself. Grow as a, as a worshiper yourself. Pick songs that are singable. Repetition, familiarity. Uh, my worship leading planning team, we've just narrowed our repertoire and tr- we're trying to teach some of the songs uh, so that the congregation can become more familiar with them and sing them more easily. Singing songs that you don't like for the sake of others. I think this is one of the big things a worship leader can do. Uh, your job, if you're a worship leader, and your job, if you're a tech director, is to make decisions for the greater good of the body of Christ, not to make decisions for the greater good of your tech budget or of your favorite song or of any of those things. Who cares about any of those things? What's important is that you're making decisions for the vibrancy of your corporate singing community. Jonathan Edwards says this, the duty of singing uh, praises to God seems to be appointed wholly to excite and express religious affections. No other reason can be assigned why uh, we should express ourselves to God in verse rather than in prose and do it with music, but only that such is our nature and frame that these things have a tendency to move our affections. I'm going to actually uh, skip over a couple of these things here. Well, actually, I think this is helpful for you. Um, One of the other things I've struggled with is, over the years, is if I'm choosing songs for my community, that means I need to choose songs that sweep an entire range of subject matters. And a lot of the times, that means the majority of the songs that we will sing on a Sunday morning may not be my thing. I might be in a season of grief and sorrow, and if my entire set list is about grief and sorrow, I'm only serving a fraction of my community. Because someone else might be rejoicing over something, and I need to give them a song where their soul can rejoice in the goodness of God. Um, But isn't it inauthentic to sing things that I don't feel or believe? 
Uh, a passage that really, really helped me with this is Romans chapter 7. Um, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making my, me prisoner of the law of sin at work with me. That Paul in this chapter, he's, he's making this fascinating observation that there's an inner self that will always affirm the truth of the gospel even if your emotions and your affections aren't there. So I just say, if I'm celebrating and I've chosen a song so that the people in the church that need to celebrate the goodness of God has a song to do that, and I'm just not there, I'm just gonna rely on the inner self that God has transformed, and I'm gonna sing from that place, and I'm gonna do it with as much joy as I possibly can. And this will help you to sing that song with some joy and authenticity. Now, uh, a couple more just helpful things to realize. There's, there's a pendulum swing that you can do. Some churches tend to be a little bit more on the thinking side, uh, and some churches tend to be more on the emotion side. So one of the things we do in the area of music is it tends to lean more on the emotional side, but you can help your church grow there. Like if you're a little bit more of a stoic church, help your church let go a little bit. Because again, when we do that, and we don't have to calculate every single thing we're doing in a service, and we let ourselves be abandoned to the emotional center, we're actually letting the way of Jesus access a larger percentage of who we are as a human being. Um, and just know that there's an emotional uh, a pendulum swing that can happen, and you could, you could be in any of those. And my, my challenge to you would be, to, as a leader, figure out where you are and help your church grow in one or the other, depending on where you are. Uh, a final note, and I think this is a really uh, important thing, is sacrificial singing transforms us and unites the church. Um, this is a challenge you can give to your congregation, but it's also a challenge you can give to yourself as a leader and to your teams. We will choose as leaders to lean in and try and worship with everything that we are, even when it's not our jam, even when it's not our favorite song. We're gonna sing the hymns. We're gonna sing um, the, the modern song that uh, just came out last week. We're gonna sing all of these different things because we're serving a diverse, wide range of people. Paul hammers this issue over and over and over again. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We make decisions as leaders, not based upon our personal preference, based upon, but instead based upon what is best for the community. Now, um, the crazy thing about what Paul's saying here is he seems to think, both in Colossians, uh, or in this section of Colossians, and in several other passages, that corporate singing is a uniting activity. Doesn't he know about worship wars? I don't know about you, but I think that uh, there has been almost no thing in the church that has caused more disunity than the music portion of a corporate gathering. Am I wrong? So is Paul just naive? Does he just not get it? No, I think he, he knows exactly what he's saying, but it's a sacrificial thing that's required. Uh, a lot of scholars, when it says here, uh, a lot of scholars believe that psalms, hymns, and sp- songs from the Spirit are actually, uh, in, a- in the ancient early church, would have been three different genres of music. And if they're humans, and they are, like we're humans, and we are, my hunch is some of them liked psalms. Some of them like hymns. And some of them liked psalms from the Spirit more than the other options. And he says, sing them all. Sing them. And when you're singing one that isn't your favorite, you're going to do it. And it's the act of self-sacrificial singing, leaning in, showing up for your church body in a category that's not your favorite, that act is what creates unity. He says it again here. 
We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and to please, uh, rather than to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbor for their good to build them up. May the God who gives endurance, he, so he, he says it's about their good, but then he culminates this section in Romans. He says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He believes that there's this self-sacrifice combined with singing that creates a unparalleled paralleled transforming power in the body of Christ. So don't take what you do lightly. Just lead into this direction. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He does it again. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, submitting to one another. So when was the last time you submitted to the older family in your church that just wants you to sing a hymn from time to time? When was the last time that you didn't stiff arm a a person who wants to start a choir or whatever it may be? You need to strategically find ways to make leadership decisions that you are not a fan of for the sake of the body of Christ. Choose to sing styles, subjects, songs that you don't like is part of what makes corporate singing transformative. So our singing is about community. It is not about you and it's not about me. The richness of your singing is connected to the health and the richness of the church family. So if if it's starting to become stale for you, or if it's starting to become stale for some of the members in your church and it's no longer hitting that point, that something that they're longing for in the singing time, maybe it's because the worship of their neighbor needs to grow. And I don't know how to give you all the tips and tricks and how to help an entire community go on this journey, um, but I would challenge you as a leader to try and figure out how do I help an entire community become worship leaders of each other, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So in closing, did you know that Paul says that we're allowed to boast and we're allowed to take pride in one thing, in the new heavens and the new earth? He says it right here in 1 Thessalonians. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord? And one translation says, in which we will boast in, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. So he says, I picture one day a worship service before the throne of God, and I will boast in one thing, and it will be the fervency and the beauty and the goodness of my neighbor's worship. That's what I can boast in. And that's the invitation that you can take as a leader, is to not just grow in your own worship, but help your entire community grow as a worship leader, because that's the one thing we take into all of eternity, is the fervency and the vibrancy and the goodness of our united voices declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. If you just indulge me and maybe stand for a second, we'll just sing doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. And holy ghost. Amen. 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 What a legend. Aaron, I'm telling you, I'm telling you.